So good evening and good afternoon and good morning, depending on where you are. And thank you so much for joining. This is actually part six of Upgrade to Awesome series, but it's also a self-sufficient, a self-standing topic about how to get into the simcha of Chodesh Adar, how to feel, how can I feel happy when I'm feeling pain? And, um, and of course, this answer for those of you who have been with us for the last five weeks, or if you've listened, you know, on the to the recordings, you have some ideas already about how to let go of the misery, um, but we keep, we, we, we still also never talked about this. Actually, how do we let go of pain that gets in our way of getting into happiness? And, um, and there's some really good questions. So I'm gonna just do a little opening um, and I wanna share 10 ideas, 10 little tools that I came up with and, um, and then we'll open up to conversation. And I hope that you'll, I hope that I wanna encourage everyone to participate and make it a personal experience because when you, you know, through questions and discussions, that's what makes this, that's really what makes it a group and not just a, a talk, okay? So maybe you've heard this before, but I, it's one of my favorite clown stories. A guy comes to the local rabbi and he complains of feeling depressed and sad and stuck and very disempowered and weak and no energy and lethargic and whatever. And, um, and the rabbi says, you know, Hashgacha Pratis, it's so good you came to me today because just this week, there's this uh, amazing person who's passing through our town. Um, he's known as the uh, the clown, the yellow clown, or whatever name he gave him, and um, and he really, really uplifts and energizes and recharges and makes people so happy. Really elevates people's spirits, and you should go hear him, and that's really going to give you the boost that you need. And the guy turns to the rabbi and he gets very serious, and he says, Rabbi, I know, I am that clown. And I, I love this story because I feel like we are all that clown. Here in this group, we are a bunch of women and we are caregivers. We're mothers or grandmothers, sisters, friends, daughters, neighbors, work employees, employers. And we spend so much of our time giving to other people, making other people happy, nurturing, taking care of others. And, and, um, and yet we really have our own pain to deal with. And very often this pain, if when we don't deal with our pain, it really becomes paralyzing. It limits us, it keeps us stuck, and it really sucks the joy and the energy out of our lives. So today I hope to gain, first of all, some cl clarity about what happiness is not. So what the goal is, so we get some clarity about what we're trying to reach and then some practical ideas of how, what, how to deal with our pain so that it doesn't become paralyzing, so that it doesn't inhibit our ability to get in the way of our really ability to live and be fully alive and vibrant and even joyous. So first of all, you know, the reason why we're talking about this now on a very personal level, as the Rosh Shabbos Mevarchim, Chaydash Adar, I heard somebody singing the happy tune of that symbolizes, that represents Purim. And as I heard that tune, it really entered my heart. Instead of entering as a symbol of joy, it entered as a symbol of pain. Because, and, it, and, and as I was thinking about it, I realized that this time last year was when COVID came to New York. Depending on where you live, it could be it came earlier or later, but for, for us here on, in New York, um, it, it came around Purim time. Just before Purim, there was talk about, you know, maybe not getting together and maybe canceling the get togethers. And most people just went ahead with it. And, um, and it was a real super spreader day. And right after then people started getting sick. We lost so many precious lives. It was such a traumatic time. It was a time of real uncertainty and confusion. Anybody who was um, suffering on some level, people who had shalom bias issues or, or pain involving one of their children or dealing with any 
any challenge that kind of, you know, emotional wellness, um, any kind of struggles that like really takes all of our energy just to get through a regular day. This really puts so many people over the edge and we didn't just lose lives, you know, to, to in Levias, we lost souls. We have so many broken hearts and we're still picking up the pieces to right now and we're still in it. Many people have lost precious dreams. Um, many people are struggling with unsolvable problems, problems of lost parnasa or lack of shalom bias or the pain of our children being in pain, which for many, many you know, teenagers, it kind of pushed them also over the edge. Um, so so I, I don't have to, <laughs> I, I don't think I have to uh, elaborate on the depth or the extent or the broadness of, of the problems. And here we are, it's almost Chaydesh Adar, it's almost Purim already. And we're, who's ready to jump into the joy? Who's ready to let go of that pain? I know that I wasn't. And as I started looking around and talking to different people, I realized that I'm not alone. And so I'm here really to, sh to hear from you as much as I want to share what I've been thinking about over the last two weeks maybe it's three weeks, um, um, you know, in, in, in leading up to this, but, um, you know, there's no button that we could press to let go of the pain and invite joy. So it's a process and um, nobody should judge themselves by anything that I share tonight or that anyone shares tonight. Um, the first, you know, don't judge yourself for not being ready even to let go of that pain and to embrace a season and a yum tiff of joy. Um, so let's jump in. First of all, I want to put one one thing out there. You know, sometimes when we think about Simcha and we think about Purim, we think about clowns and ribbons and, um, you know, getting drinking and real outward celebration. Simcha is not about parties and drinking wine. Maybe the parties and the drinking wine is an expression of Simcha you know, for some people, for many people, but that's really not, that's really not what, what Purim is about. Purim is an Avaida. It's, it's actually the holiest day of the year. Even Yom Kippur is called Yom HaKippurim. It's like Purim. There's a, there's a, a, a very, very holy, elevated, unique, awesome power that this day holds. We'll be talking about this more in Merz Hashem on Wednesday afternoon, 1230 PM on Eastern time for those of you in California, that's the morning. And I know that many people can't join at that time, but the recording will be available. We're going to talk about what makes Purim so special. You know, what, what is it that is so special about it? But it's certainly not about clowns. Okay. Maybe in a state of Simcha, we do that too, but that's not what the essence of, of Purim is about. And when we think about joy, if you're not feeling like getting up and dancing, that doesn't mean you're not that's not the symbol of joy. Simcha is also not the, ap, ap, the absence of pain. Hashem is the one who created pain. Hashem is the one who created all the situations in our lives that are giving us the pain. Is it possible to be happy despite the pain? Absolutely. Being in pain doesn't mean that we don't have bitachon, it doesn't mean that we cannot be happy. It just means that we have to deal with our pain so that it doesn't become misery, so that it doesn't become paralyzing, so that we don't become desperate for relief. We need to relieve ourselves so that we don't get to that point of absolute desperation where we really can't live with ourselves anymore. Simcha is an avayda, it's a service. It's an action, a series of actions that we could do to, as a way of serving Hashem. Of course, Simcha is an emotion. It's an emotion of joy, expansiveness, delight. But it's not, the, the, the Avaida, the mitzvah, is not about pressing a button and turn on the joy. It's an Avaida. And the bottom line essence of what that Avaida is about, that it's, it's, it's the Avaida of, valuing Hashem. 
Hashem is the supreme value. Hashem is the one who creates the world, who created the world, who directs and is in charge of everything. He's the one we depend on. He pulls all the strings of our lives. He gives, he takes. He, he's, he's the one in charge. We're totally, completely dependent on nobody and nothing but Hashem. And so when we realize that, we value Hashem. We realize his importance. We value him. But the fact is Hashem is hidden. Hashem has hidden himself in this world. And on the outside of his hiddenness, it seems like other things have power. And so we value other things, even in a certain way. And we value other people. We feel dependent on things and on people in a way that maybe is more than we value Hashem. Or maybe momentarily, obviously, and deep inside, we all value Hashem more than anything else. The, every year has the capacity for Mesir nefesh literally to give up our lives rather than sever our relationship with Hashem. We cannot disconnect from Hashem. We belong. And yet in a moment of unawareness, it, we could forget about that connection. We could forget about that value that we have for Hashem. And in that place, we value other things and other people more than, more than we value Hashem. And that's the Avayda of Simcha. The Avayda of Simcha is to do what it takes to spend time thinking about Hashem so that we value Hashem, to develop our relationship with Hashem and our consciousness of Hashem's presence in our life, in our life so that we feel joy knowing that He is with us, so that we feel peace knowing that He comforts us, so we feel reassured knowing that He is giving us strength. That, that's the Avaida of Simcha. No, to, that, to, to value Hashem enough that we have emotions around Hashem's presence. So that the thought of Hashem cheering us on and giving us courage or standing by our side and doing everything that's in our best interest, the more we value Hashem, the more those thoughts give us strength peace, comfort, reassurance, and courage. And that's the Avayda of Simcha. And to appreciate that, we really also need to appreciate the whole concept of why we are here in this world altogether. We're not in this world to reach a level of peace. We're not in this world to reach a level of, 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 of serenity, of joy, of happiness. The goal of life is not to be happy. It would seem in this world that the goal of life, the pinnacle of all achievements is to arrive at a place of happiness. But that's not how it is in Yiddishkeit. That's not how it is in Taira life. The goal of life is to fulfill the purpose for which we were created. The goal of life is to come to value Hashem in a real way, in a way that makes a difference to our mood, to our behavior, to the story of our day on a practical, very, very practical level. That's the purpose of life. And so from that perspective, pain is part of that because pain is an opportunity to let Hashem make a difference. Without Hashem's, without that awareness of Hashem's presence, without the ability to let Hashem make a difference, we become drained by our pain. And it becomes, you know, if we look at life, the goal of life is to be happy, then pain is the most shameful thing we could have. And I personally um, feel, you know, even with all this work, I still feel ashamed when I, when, I, when I recognize that I'm in pain, there's a certain element of shame. It's like, wait, it's not supposed to be that way. And there's two reasons for this. Number one is that, I mean, there's three but they come, there's two reasons, but they come from one thing, which is maybe a third reason. And that is that whenever we have intense emotions and intense possibility for awareness and connection and developing a relationship with Hashem, whenever there's a place for fulfilling our life's purpose, that's where the Yetzirah is going to invest a lot of effort. So pain is not a bad thing. It's a powerful thing. Pain is the birthing stone of so much growth. Pain is the birthing stone of change. Pain is where we become something more. 
someone more. We develop strengths that we never would have needed. And then once we have them, we realize we never would want to have lived without them. Even, you know, you could only say this retrospectively, retroactively, but even with, even with having had the pain, we're like, you know, the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe suffered tremendously in Soviet Russia. He, he was literally tortured in prison for the crime of perpetuating Jewish life, upholding the Jewish structure, the infrastructure of shuls and and shaykhtim and bris mila and all that, all the, 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 the structure that keeps Jewish life thriving and alive. And for that, he was tortured. And after his whole, his whole experience, we have to remember that he, his life, he lost so many of his family members. He lost very, he, he lost precious Hasidim that he was very, very deeply connected with. And he suffered physically for the rest of his life. He never recovered from the torture that he endured in Soviet Russia. And he said, if somebody would give me a million rubles, I would not go back to prison for one day. But if somebody would want, would give me 5 million rubles to spear me of that experience, I wouldn't sell it. So none of us want to experience pain. And I wanna use this opportunity of so many women gathering together to, first of all, to wish every, every one of us, Hashem should heal our pain as only he can. Hashem should heal every broken heart. Hashem should wipe away your tears and you should feel that in the form of beautiful blessings and miracles beyond your expectations. And I know you have good imagination. So beyond your imagination, literally revealed beautiful simcha, nachas, gesund, good health on every level, you know, joy, healthy families, beautiful relationships, um, all pain and suffering should be removed in this, from this world and we should have Mashiach because that's, um, that's the ultimate joy. That's the one miracle that will take care of all our personal miracles. I want to add a Rafua Shalema for Chaya Peril Bas Freda, um, a young mother and grandmother who is fighting for her life as we speak. Hashem should take away the pain. How do we deal with it? Um, and, and let's recognize first and foremost that it's not a curse in itself. Ultimately, it is something though we don't understand it. Even the one thing that we could understand about pain is that we don't understand, but there's something in it that Hashem wants us to grow from. I'm just thinking that I just said that the Yetzirah, that there were three reasons and I didn't say the two of them. So let me just say them quickly. Number one, wherever there is room for growth, um, the Yetzirah creeps in. And the two things that the Yetzirah does with pain that makes it so um, harmful is that number one, because there's this idea of happiness as a goal in and of itself, happiness as an end of the story, happiness as an ideal to be revered and pursued and obtained at all costs. So pain, that gets in our way of happiness feels shameful. And I think that that's the worst thing about pain, that there's a certain element of shame around it. That's number one. The second thing about the way the Yetzirah gets into us is the misery. And really these things are all connected because sometimes pain is that loss in itself. Misery is the belief that because of this loss, because of this pain, I cannot do my life. I am too ashamed, I am too paralyzed, I am inhibited. This is the end of it all. Um, this is the end of my road. It feels like we're never gonna get out of it. So let's jump in and talk about how we could get out of it, how we can deal with it. If the goal is not to get out of it, the goal is to process it in a way that brings, some, brings something beautiful out of ourselves. Pain is like birth. You know, when a baby cries, there's so, when a baby's born, there's so much pain, right? The baby cries and we rejoice because there's a new life that has been born. And I think pain is like that. You know, we cry and we cry bitter tears because it hurts, because there's a loss, because it's, it shatters our dreams at times. 
It shatters our vision of what we would have liked. And at the same time, there's a, there's a birth, there's a moment when something beautiful comes out of it. And sometimes we don't know, we don't get to see. For many situations, we might not see the good in really painful situations and tragedies. We will not see the good until Mashiach comes. And yet still, even while we're here before Mashiach comes, while we're processing it, there is a strength that we need to access that we could only access specifically from that place of pain because it's such a deep emotion. And we have that opportunity to fulfill our purpose in a way that we would not have been able to do had we not had the pain. And because of that, because of our ability and opportunity to fulfill our purpose, that in itself is joy. The 12th of the 12 principles, the 12th, the Yud Beis Pesukim Amemar Chazal, that are the found that, you know, the book, Your Awesome Self is structured around these 12 principles, right? This 12th, the 12th one is a line actually from the Baal HaTanya where, and, and quoting, um, Yismach Yisrael, the Isav Yisrael should rejoice with his maker, Yismach Yisrael Ba'esav are not words of Tanya. The Tanya explains, the Baal Tanya explains these words. What does it mean that Yisrael, Yismach Yisrael Ba'esav? In what way, what, what do you mean uh, a Yid should hold Hashem's hands and rejoice? Yismach Yisrael Ba'esav, a Jew should rejoice with his maker? What, what Rejoice, celebrate with, our, with, with Hashem? What are we celebrating? How are we even coming together with Hashem on the same page, on the same emotional level. And he explains that what's the joy that we share with Hashem? What's the great celebration? What is the root cause of our happiness and the, and, and the, and the ultimate expression of the Aveda of Simcha, the work that we need to do is Shekol mi shahu mi zara Yisrael, every single one of us, we have a reason to celebrate. We have a reason to rejoice. We have a reason to let our hearts be happy. Why? Because Hashem is happy. Why is Hashem happy? Because Hashem is so happy in that space where we fulfilled our life's purpose, where we let Hashem's presence make a difference where we transform this inch of our heart, this little bit of darkness, very deep darkness in our hearts, in our lives, in our situations, in our relationships, we transform that place from a place of pain and paralyzing pain to we opened ourselves up to a little bit of light, to letting Hashem make a difference. That is the ultimate experience of joy. And I'm, I'm translating that to, to mean pain, Obviously, the pasuk Yismach Yisrael Ba'esav, and um, the the concept of joy being a celebration of our ability to make Hashem happy and rejoicing in Hashem's joy and feeling His joy and 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 celebrating in His embrace because we fulfilled our purpose. That that applies to any mitzvah that we do, but but because pain. The, the work that it takes to deal with pain is so, so, so deep. It takes so much investment of effort. So that effort, the more the effort, the more deep we're reaching into our heart, the more purpose there is to fulfill there, the more space, um, the, more it, the more value it has in the, ter in in, in the sense of transforming, you know, in the transformative sense, right? Because it, it takes more work. It's more darkness. So by the, the light has that much more value, right? Because light that comes from darkness shines so much more brightly. The effort that it takes to deal with pain means that the value to Hashem is so much greater. And that's why anybody, if you even take one thing out of this, if you're able to wake up tomorrow morning and put one foot in front of the other, despite your pain, and, and, and the reason you're able to do that is because you are embracing Hashem's presence, Hashem's courage, Hashem's strength within you. That is, that is joy. It doesn't look like the kind of joy the guy, 
you know, dancing with a bottle of whiskey, but that's not, that's not necessarily what Hashem wants. The Avaida of Simcha is inviting Hashem into our story, valuing Hashem enough to let that invitation make a difference. Okay. Okay, I'm going to jump into the 10 tools, okay? Okay, so first, the first tool is to validate your experience. It's real. Validate the pain. Don't hide from it. Acknowledge that it's there because you might want to hide from it because of the shame. Don't hide from it. The first thing is when you're feeling pain, acknowledge that it's there. Talk about it even with your own self. Gain awareness of what's going on. Hold it. You cannot put it down before you picked it up. You cannot let go of it before you know what it is, before you touched it with your full hands, before you stand in it with both feet. Number two is watch for that shame that's creeping in. Like we said before, the Yetzirah has a way of creeping in wherever there's a lot of opportunity. Shame is the first thing that creeps in when we have pain. We think that pain is embarrassing because I should have my act together. It's not supposed to be this way. I think another element of where shame comes in is not just because we idealize happiness and pain seems to be the opposite of that happiness, but I think it's also because pain is often very private. It's my personal story. It's what's going on in my life. And I could be showing up as a very functional person, but inside my pain is tearing me apart and it feels dysfunctional. And that gap between what's going on on the outside and what I'm feeling inside could, could make me feel like a shameful liar. It could be a lot. It could be, it could be another whole pain in and of itself. And so that's why I want to, you know, say number three would be to talk about your pain to another person. Talk to somebody who understands you. The minute you're talking to somebody who understands you, you take away a lot of the shame because that whole piece of like, I am someone totally different. You know, I'm, I'm lying to the world because I feel so broken and messed up and confused and heavy and dark inside. And here I am trying to function in a world where everyone else is on a merry-go-round. The music is blasting. People are coming, going, shopping as if there's no pain in the world, right? Talking about it to another person who understands you makes you realize you're not alone. Everybody has pain. Everybody has stuff. Used to be maybe we had this notion that only, you know, Fartsara to mention, you know, there are certain people who, have, who are Fartsara, like they have sufferings. There is no person in this world who doesn't have tsaris, real tsaris, real, um, real problems, real unsolvable problems. And with that comes real pain. So talk about it with somebody who understands you. Be understood. Understanding is liberating. It really, really, really releases the shame. Um, and we don't need to know, you know, we don't need to know everyone's pain. You could know that everyone's in pain. You could assume that everybody around you is just doing their best to show up with joy, with dignity, with a sense of energy. But you could also trust that everybody has a story. And by you talking about it with people and making it okay to talk about it, and I'm not saying now to go unload and talk about your pain to every person, you know, but for sure you need at least one person in the world that can hear you and understand you. And besides that, it's okay to make it a conversation. Yeah, I'm in, how are you? Yeah, I'm in a lot of pain. I'm okay, but I'm okay. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in a lot of pain, but I'm okay. Let's, it's okay to talk about pain. I think, I think it's time to make it part of the conversation. So it, first of all, for ourselves, it's liberating. It makes it normal. It takes away the shame. And also it's liberating for other people. It just makes it a healthier environment where we don't have to fake, we don't have to talk about the details of our pain, but we also don't have to hide it. We could, it gives us some relief to be understood. Okay, so that was number three, talk to somebody who understands you. Number four is a lot of painful situations are recurring. 
they're not something that if I spend an hour thinking about it, now I'm going to be relieved and I will solve the problem and I will never have to deal with it again. Most of the pain in our lives is recurring. So I have a new, uh, a new, a new order <laughs> that I tried to follow. And that is I deal with my pain by appointment only. Pain is welcome in my heart and in my mind by appointment only. If it's something, obviously, if it's something that hits me in my face, you know, it, 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 it bursts through the door, we can't make an appointment with it. We have to deal with it. it, it it's here. Okay, something happened, you have to deal with it. But ongoing problems, painful realities in your life, in, in our lives, we all have painful realities. It, we have to deal with it by appointment only. An hour of thinking of it right now in this moment, if I think about it, it, it's an illusion to think that if I think about it right now in middle of my shopping or in middle of my dinner time or middle of whatever I'm doing right now, it's a distraction. It's, a, it's just trying to pull me down. If I make an appointment with it, um, that's, when, that's when I know I'm coming to it with a sense of purpose and a sense of empowerment. Okay, um, so that was number four. <laughs> and number five is that we shouldn't do misery. Don't, don't do misery. Don't do misery. Misery and pain are two totally different things. Pain is from Hashem. Misery is something that we create when we fight the pain, when we refuse to deal with reality, when we try to hide from it, when we try to control it, when we try to beat up the people who are part of it. Suffering is ourselves. Suffering is our own story. Pain is the fact of the reality, what it is. And suffering and misery is the belief that because of this reality, I cannot do my life. It's the, it's, the, it's the suffering that we build on top of the pain. And then there's number six is another way we build on top of the pain. And this I realize more and more and more from my own personal experience and from the questions that people shared. You know, we, we've been doing a workshop now, right? It was a six part workshop. This is, this is number six. And a lot of the questions that people were asking privately we're, you know, we're talking about coming to a place of peace. We're talking because the whole workshop was about elevating ourselves to a place of greater energy and joy and inner peace. And a lot of people's questions were like, okay, this is my problem. You know, this is my painful reality. And how do I plug all of that we're talking about into my painful reality? Really that, that question is one question, is, is an answerable question. The question that I felt was maybe not answerable was more like when the question was an answer, meaning I this whole thing, these ideas don't work for me because I have a painful reality. And when people share their questions, which were, which are more like, these questions are more like statements, what I was hearing over and over again is because my husband doesn't have Parnassa, it means that I am a bad wife. Because I am not yet married, it, be, it means I am not a deserving person. And everybody knows that. And everybody looks down at me because of that. And they see it when they see my ring that doesn't have, my finger that doesn't have a ring. Because I have a child in pain, I must be a failure of a parent. I am a failure of a mother. And every day when I wake up in the morning, that's the first thing I think about because I am that much of an epic failure. Do you hear what, what the, the pattern in all of these? The pattern in all of these is that we make commentaries about our pain. So that's number six is don't make nasty commentaries about your pain. Pain is from Hashem. We don't know why Hashem does what he does. It's a, it's a, it's a unmet need. It's a fact in and of itself. There's no, we don't have to interpret it to mean that we're not good enough, that we're shameful in some way, that we are, it's not symbolic in any way of who we are. It's just a fact that we need to deal with. That's it. 
And when we deal with it, we're, we're the most beautiful people on earth because we're fulfilling our purpose. That is the deepest expression of if du es Hashem besimcha. That is the simcha that mishenichnas adar marbim besimcha. That's the simcha that we want to increase in chaydash adar. So these, these comments and associations, I don't deserve it, I'm not good enough, I am a failure, something's wrong with me, all of that is commentaries about our pain. They're commentaries on our unmet needs. We are not Hashem. To comment, to make a commentary like that is simply off the mark. It's judging Hashem's work. It's putting a spin on a story that doesn't even, it's not even true. It's not, it's, 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 it's coming totally from our Yetzirah and from the world's idealization of happiness and the, and the illusion that happiness is something that could be pursued and acquired if only we are smart enough, okay? So blessings are Hashem's kindness and pain is also from Hashem and it's also a kindness. It's not yet a revealed kindness, but don't make nasty commentaries about it. Number seven is, Choose a perspective that includes Hashem's presence. Choose a perspective that includes, you know, when we're in pain, we don't get to choose what happened. We don't get to choose what other people are doing. We don't get to choose the facts. There's no magic wand to instantly, automatically change the reality as it is. And the reality might be very painful. But what we do have a chance to choose and we have full opportunity to choose is how we spin the story, how we tell the story. How am I going to look at myself in context of this painful reality? How am I going to look at my, the, the other person? How am I going to look at my children? How am I going to look like my, how am I going to look at my husband? How am I going to look at my parent, my friends, my, how am I going to look at the world? Despite it, not despite this pain, but in context of this pain. We have full choice to choose that perspective, to let go of the nasty commentaries and consciously choose a perspective that's, that's aligned with Hashem's power, Hashem's, um, Hashem's goodness, Hashem's presence, Hashem's love for us, Hashem's trusting us, Hashem's cheering us on, and um, Hashem just simply believing in us. And when we're not choosing a conscious, healthy perspective, I can guarantee you, and I'm telling you this from my own experience, whenever I'm not choosing a conscious choice, I will be sucked up in a nasty commentary. Because if I'm not choosing a perspective, my Yetzirah will, will give me one to wear. And I won't even realize that I am holding on to a perspective. I will see it as a fact. So we really need to consciously be working on choosing a healthy perspective, uh, one that's aligned with our value, one that is truly compassionate and caring and generous and loving. Okay, um, you know, just on that note, there's a story of the vision of Sarebbe that I love where he was walking once on a Friday night and it was a beautiful, beautiful, almost magical night and he was walking with his Hasidim and he made a comment that's so true and, it, and it's aligned with this because we think of Avaida of Simcha as you know, something that we do for Hashem. Ultimately, it is an Avaida that we do for Hashem and the fact that we do it for Hashem makes it, it elevates it to a level of purpose and deeper meaning that's so much bigger than ourselves, but ultimately it also benefits ourselves. And the vision of Sarebbe captured that thought in a beautiful line on that magical night. He said, you know, Kol Yisrael yesh lahem chelek haba. every single Jew has a portion in Olam Haba. We all get there. We all have our part in Olam Haba. But you know what? Only a Yid who believes in Hashem has Olam Haza. That world, the future world, we all have a part of it. When Mashiach comes, we will all have a part of that world. Kol Yisrael yesh lahem chelek la'olam haba. Every one of us has a portion in olam haba. But to have olam hazeh, to have a good, 
happy physical life, we need to be a believing Jew. Because the more we believe in Hashem, the more we value Hashem, the more His presence influences the perspective that we take on our pain. And that makes all the difference to how we carry that pain, how we live with it, how we process it. Number eight, I spoke about this a little bit before, but along the lines of choosing a perspective, what are you gaining from being in pain? Even sometimes while we're in pain, if you've been, you know, personally, for me, there are certain painful situations in my life that have been there for a while, you know, and it, and, and, and so today, even when I'm in pain, I could appreciate the value of pain because I, I would never be able to understand all the people that I understand. And I would never be able to relate to people who I relate to if I didn't have pain. My pain has made me more sensitive, more understanding, more compassionate. Um, I feel like it's, it's enabled me to connect more deeply with people, all people. And I, I would never want it any other way. And so even when I'm in pain today, I could appreciate, I could trust that something good is coming out of it. But I think it's a good question to ask yourself if you're dealing with pain over a period of time, look at yourself and look at your before and after. Look at what you, look how you've grown. Celebrate that growth. Celebrate what, how the pain has made you a person that you're, that you're proud to be that a person that you like being, that you enjoy being, because there always is something and something beautiful always, just like a baby is born after labor, something beautiful is born through pain. It's always, it, it is always there. Um, and that, it, it also helps us to, it, it just, it's so helpful. It's so liberating. Even, you know, once you start looking at pain that way, it takes the edge off of it, even when it's very intense. Number nine is um, these two things are going to be about how to invite joy, even when you're in pain. You know, when we're in pain, we often think about, you know, my life is so good, but it's over, you know, all the blessings are overshadowed by this pain. I have so many blessings, but this gets in the way of all of that. So to that, and, and I could relate to that because our minds can only, we can think about anything, but we have a spotlight and only one idea can be in that spotlight in any given moment. And because pain is so deep and, um, and it's so, so, so involving and absorbing, it takes up a lot of space and it takes up a lot of time. So when we're in pain, we really, it takes up that spotlight for it could take up our spotlight and kind of keep coming in the face of our spotlight, keep coming to the forefront of our mind in a very absorbing manner. And it could cloud our view of the blessings. So we have to consciously take time when, and when you're dealing with a painful situation, you need to do this with more intensity, with more focus and with more investment of time, effort and energy. Take time literally to notice the blessings that you have in your life. Just like you can't, just like the, the, the blessings doesn't, you know, the blessings don't take away your pain. Don't let your pain take away your blessings. Don't let your pain, you know, the pain is bad enough as it is. The pain is what it is. Don't add to it by letting it take away from the goodness in your life. And the only way to do that is really by consciously taking time every single day, sometimes more than once a day, to look around you, to look around your heart, to look around your family, to look around your relationship, to look around even that very space where the painful reality has parked in the forefront of your mind, even within the pain. Find a blessing, find something to be grateful for. Find something that makes your heart say, Whoa, I am so grateful for this. It really gives you a lot of relief. Gratitude gives birth to expansiveness and relief. And it, it's the opposite because pain is paralyzing. Gratitude is liberating. It's energizing. It's such a good thing. So really um, do that. Take time to do that every single day. And number 10 is 
to be kind to yourself, to be compassionate to yourself. And, and this is true for always, but especially when you're in pain, be loving and compassionate to yourself. Be the adult that you need to be for yourself. Be the adult to your brokenness. Imagine how you would take care of your friend or somebody that you really love very, very dearly. If they would be in pain, what would you tell them? How would you speak to them? So many times when we're in pain, because we have these nasty commentaries in our mind and because we have this shame, so we label ourselves in shameful ways, that really is not nice. It's not compassionate. It's not loving. We really need to be loving and compassionate to ourselves. Be sensitive, be caring, be understanding, be accepting. Give yourself space. And, um, and what that looks like in practical terms is all of the above, doing all of the above. And we'll do a quick review of that, but I want to open up to discussion. Some beautiful comments in the chat. I want to encourage everyone to read it. Someone's asking if there's an email you could subscribe to. Yes, info at energizedliving.org or 718-576-0338. I want to just repeat your question because it's such a good question. The question is, and I'm going to summarize it, so correct me if I'm wrong, okay? Um, the question, as I understand it, is, is hap, does simcha mean laughing? Is it possible to be fulfilling the mandate of if du es Hashem besimcha, even through pain and tears? I want to first answer with a question, okay? Yeah. My, my question is like this. In the pain, uh, where are you going? Where are you going with the pain? And I think that's the answer to the question. Am I, is my pain taking me towards shame? Is it taking me towards a spiral of, of disempowerment, a spiral of misery? from which I will, I will feel desperate enough to engage in self-destructive behaviors. I will do things, I will, I will eat a tub of ice cream to calm the raging fire in my heart, mindlessly, of course, not consciously, but subconsciously, that's what I'm trying to do because the ice cream feels good on my heart, right? Or I will browse the internet and waste, waste time just because I need to just escape from my mind because my mind is such a dangerous neighborhood, right? Because I just need to take, I need to numb or I'll just get busy. I'll distract myself with anything, overeating, overworking, over indulging, over, you know, just anything. And, and um, you know, even over drinking, you know, it's, it's uh, so where are we going with that? Where are we going? I think that's the key. Where am I going with the pain? Because pain comes from Hashem. It's not a bad thing. Where am I going with it? That is my choice. Am I going towards shame and misery? And the reason why we go there is because the whole world made happiness a, a getchka. Happiness has become an idol. It's on a pedestal of like a God in itself. It's like the be all and end all. Everyone in America has the right to pursue life, liberty, and happiness as if this is the goal that we all want to pursue, as if it's pursuable and attainable through pursuit, right? So when we see happiness as the be all and end all, then we feel so much shame in our pain. When we see, you know, when we see ourselves as, as the powers, you know, we are the ones in control and I'm supposed to be able to manage my life. And it's possible for me, if I would only be smarter, if I would only say the right words to that person, then they would change. And I wouldn't have this painful situation. If I would have not let him go to the hospital, he wouldn't be, he would still be alive. You know, like we see ourselves as powers, as if we're God. We are not Hashem, we're not him. And so if we see ourselves going towards misery, um, that's coming from our Yetzirah and that's not happy, you know, that's not the Avayda of Simcha. But if in our pain, we're processing it, we're dealing, we're trying to 
take on a perspective that's aligned with our purpose. We're trying to find meaning in the pain. We're trying to find that we're, 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 we're putting our right foot in front of our left foot. We're going forward. We're gonna try to show up to whatever the day has to offer with dignity, with courage, with compassion for ourselves and other people. That is the Avaida of Simcha. There's nothing else like it in the world. And perhaps because of the effort that it takes, perhaps that's even more precious to Hashem than Simcha that is about, that looks like, you know, you know, a, a bottle of whiskey and, and singing on the top of your lungs. Because in Yiddishkeit, it's never about the destination. It's always about the process. It's never how far you are up on the quote unquote ladder. It's always about what it takes to get, to climb one step forward. So if in your pain, you took one step forward and you let Hashem make a drop of a difference. And with that difference, you're not smiling, you're not happy, but you feel even a drop of relief. I can't, I can't think of a better, more beautiful way to serve Hashem. And that's what we're trying to do here with Misha Nichnas Adar Mar bin Basimcha doesn't mean pressing a button. And now it doesn't mean turning up the volume of the music or making the music faster. It means investing more effort in our, you know, value of Hashem so that when we think about him and we think about what he wants of us and we think about all the things we've been learning about in this series and all the things you could learn about in, in Shar Habitachin, right? And in so many svarim about Hashem, letting that make a difference, that's the Avaida. That's the Avaida of Simcha. So the, so the question is, we're talking about talking to people and being able to say, I'm in pain, but I'm okay. But what about when people can't hear that and they feel awkward and they don't know what to do with it? I personally, you know who those people are. So I wouldn't say it to them because they don't know what to deal with, what to do with it. But I do believe that many, many people do know what to do with it. Increasingly, more people have more awareness and know what to do with it. And, and, the, and when, as we do this, we create a community where it's okay where pain is not shame, pain is part of life. It's a natural human part of life. And I think that um, we could talk to, we can't talk to all people about it, but we can talk to many people about it. So yeah, I wouldn't talk to somebody who, who's just gonna feel awkward and not gonna know where to bury themselves. <laughs> but thanks for that question. Okay, let's do a quick review. And I'll also, Be'ezer Sashem, I'll try to post this. Okay, so some tools. Number one, validate your experience. Talk about it, acknowledge the pain that it's there. Number two, watch out for shame that creeps in. That means labeling yourself. Don't label yourself. Um, don't, don't hide it. Don't run away from it. Accept it, embrace it. It's part of Hashem's plan. Number three is to talk to somebody who understands you because that liberates you from the pain. It also you know, helps break that shame of that, that dissonance, like the, that separation between who I am on the outside and who I am on the inside, okay? Number four is that recurring pain is by appointment only. Set times to think about your pain, to ponder them, to strategize about them, to just reflect and be with, have a cup of tea with your pain. Make an appointment for that. Don't just allow it to hijack your mind at any time of the day or night. Number four, number five was don't do misery, where misery is the belief that because of this pain, I cannot do my life. Watch out for getting stuck in that. Watch out for looking at pain as the dead end, the, be, the, you know, the dead end of the story. Because of this loss, I will never be able to live again. Yes, it's hard to move on but it's always possible. And it might take an adjustment because a lost dream sometimes feels like a lost life, like a lost, like a lost possibility, like all ends, all doors are locked, but there's always, um, there's always a way forward. It might be an adjustment of expectations, a big adjustment of expectations, but um, there's always, always a way forward. So watch out for misery. Pay, um, misery is the belief that because of my pain, I can't do life. 
and I'm, I can't live and I'm, I can't live. I can't show up even to my life. Um, and then along that line, number six is don't make nasty commentaries. Don't make associations, judgments on yourself and on Hashem because as a result of the pain. Number seven was to choose a perspective, consciously choose a perspective. How do I want to see myself in context of the pain? Who am I in context of this painful situation? Who are the other people? Because when we don't choose a perspective, we, we take on a perspective that, that, that is the perspective of the world, which is shame, blame, guilt, and a lot of um, disempowerment. And choose a perspective that is aligned with Hashem's presence and Hashem's love and Hashem's being in charge. That, so that means no guilt, no blame, no misery, no resentment, and the work to let go of that. We spoke about that in previous weeks. Number eight is to find the gain in the pain. Find something that you are gaining. If it's something that happened in the past, look at yourself and look at the beautiful qualities that you developed because of the pain and celebrate that, embrace that, and, and, and be joyous with that. Allow yourself to feel the joy of being you. And you are a person who has had to, had to you are, you're a person who developed and evolved partly because, of course, because of the blessings, but also because of your pain. Um, and number nine was to notice and celebrate the blessings, turn the spotlight into your, on your, in your mind onto your blessings. Um, pain is what it is, but we could, we don't have to let it take away from the blessings. So consciously spend time noticing the blessings. Gratitude equals expansiveness and energy and joy. And number 10 was be kind and compassionate to yourself, um, even in the pain. You know, somebody asked a question about this before, is it possible to be serious and still enjoy? My father to me was a role model of joy. He was a very, very serious person. He took his responsibilities seriously. When someone shared with, you know, he felt pain by other people's pain. He felt pain with his own loss. He lost all his, you know, he was the only surviving memory, mem member of his immediate family. He lost three brothers, a sister and his dear mother and his father um, when he was still a young man. So, you know, it, it, it's, um, and, and from when he was a child, he was experiencing those kinds of loss. But I remember him as happy and I think of him as happy because he was at peace with himself. And I think, and with Hashem's reality, he used to talk about, he, one time I was with him in the hospital um, and he was, he had just been taken off. This was not, not, not in the past year, obviously. Um, but before that he had just been taken off a respirator. And for those of you who have experienced this, or if you've been with somebody who's experienced it with this, the 24 hours after that are excru excruciatingly painful when they're, they're, the, the, per, the patient needs to be off pain medication in order to be able to breathe, but is still in so much pain from all that, you know, from the surgical procedures that were done to the body. And he was in so much pain and the entire day he spent talking to me about how to deal with pain and how the more you value Hashem and the more you appreciate Hashem's plan and the more you let Hashem take up space, the more strength you have to tolerate the pain. And literally it, it, was, such a, it was such a big deal for him, Taira words, when he would say, and he had to um, do physical therapy, he would, and it was very, very painful to move his arm at one point, you know, and he had to practice his physical therapy. He would literally say the words of the Tanya that he memorized by heart. The, the words that had nothing to do with pain. It was just words of Tanya, but the joy that he had um, of, of connecting to the words of Tanya, the words of Taira, would gave him, gave him physical strength. And I don't, I, I really think that that is something that each of us could aspire to. And the the path of doing that is really valuing Hashem to really let Hashem make a difference. And, and that on the simplest of levels, it means waking up in the morning and thinking about Hashem 
for 30 seconds, for 10 seconds, for however many seconds you are, you have, you know, um, thinking about Hashem creates, brings Hashem to the forefront of our minds and creates more space in our hearts where we value Hashem. And that value gives us so much strength. It gives us the perspective to be compassionate to ourselves, to not get stuck in the shame about pain and to really be able to move forward and to show up to, to our lives. You know, one of my father's, fa all of us know this, he would say this very often. He would say, Im kai amar Hashem hineni. if so says Hashem, would quote from somewhere in Tanakh, I'm not even sure where those words are from, but he always said it. Im kai amar Hashem hineni. If this is what Hashem says, hineni, I am here. I'm going to show up. I'm going to show up to my life for whatever it is, with whatever I have, with whatever I have. I don't have that that I wanted. I really wanted that. But I'm going to show up to my life without that, with whatever I have with whatever I have for today, with all that I have and with, with whatever I can bring to the table today. One story that really crystallizes this for me, um, and maybe it will be inspiring for you, Reb Mendel Futterfass was a famous chassid who was also imprisoned. He was sent to Siberia for his role in helping other Yidin in, in, in Russia. Um, he was a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous outstanding human being, like uh, a real Benini from the Tanya, in the sense that like he had tremendous obviously struggle. He literally risked his life to help other people escape from Russia. And he paid for it with, I think it's 14 years of harsh labor in Siberian camps. Um, in Siberian camps where at times harsh labor and at all times suffering. And one time there were many, um, he was sitting in a prison where there were um, intellectuals, many in Russia at that time, it's interesting because in today's world also intellectuals, people who have opinions are being silenced. But in those days, it was more overt, it wasn't so subtle. And um, a, a bunch of intellectuals and professionals were sitting in prison. They had been removed from their positions because they had opinions that were not aligned with the communist government. And so they were talking once and they were reminiscing in their tremendous pain about their previous lives. You know, I used to be the head engineer in the entire center of science. And now look what happened to me. And the other person is like, I was a doctor. I was wanted. I was needed. I belong. I was helping people. And now look what's happening to me. And each of them was, you know, one was a journalist. One was a professor. One was... And you know, they were all professionals and accomplished people. And the pain that they were experienced because they lost their lives. They lost everything they had. They lost their positions. They lost their influence. They lost their connections. They lost their power. And, and here they were, they lost everything. And, and Reb Mendel was sitting there quietly. And at one point somebody turned to them and Reb Mendel shared this story. He shared many of his experiences afterwards and that gave meaning to his pain and he said this story he said that somebody turned to him at one point and said why are you so silent what about you you probably you probably were nothing before so that's why you're not in pain he said no 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 you don't understand I didn't lose anything you know why because I was a servant of Hashem before and I'm a servant of Hashem now still here I didn't nothing changed just the circumstances and conditions, the environment, the place, the location changed, but my mission statement didn't change. The possibility for accomplishing that mission statement never changed. And that's why the possibility for joy never changed because I could still be successful. I could still be fulfilled. I could still, full, I could still live. I could be fully alive as long as I could serve Hashem. As long as I can let Hashem make a difference, I am fully alive. And that's also, it's a beautiful, um, it's a beautiful story. But again, it's something that we could all aspire to. It's not something, it's not a miracle story. It's the miracle that each of us could invite into our lives when Hashem is real. The more we let Hashem be real, 
by thinking about Hashem in a personal way, by seeing ourselves in context of Hashem's truth, by seeing our pain in context of Hashem's truth, the more we do that, and it's a service, it's a work, and I don't want anybody to walk out of this room, if it, if it could be called a room, and use anything that was said as a judgment of yourself. Oh, now I have another reason to be upset at myself and another reason to hate myself because I can't even do pain right. <laughs> you know, don't do that. The Yetzirah has a way of creeping in wherever there is something powerful. And I know that what we shared tonight was very meaningful. I know it's been meaningful to me. I'm sure it's, I hope it's meaningful. At least one thing that you heard tonight is meaningful in some way, but definitely don't use it. Don't judge yourself. If your pain is so intense that you cannot hear anything, then just take number 10, which is be kind to yourself. Reach out to another person, share it, talk about it, validate it, give yourself a hug, be kind to yourself. Love is the bomb for pain. L bomb as not B-O-M-B, -B, but B-A-L-M. Love is soothing on pain, much more than ice cream. So open yourself up to love, open yourself up to connection. Open yourself up to being understood um, and, and, and definitely don't judge yourself for being in pain. This is a painful time for all of us. And some of us have more public pain. Some of us is more private, but it is for everyone. That's a good question. I want to repeat it for the recording because it's a good question. How do you deal with when someone shares with you something about their pain? Um, how do you, how, 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 what's, an, what's a good way to respond? when someone opens up about their pain. So I agree with that. So if a person is sharing, and I think that part of why we think that we need to say something to take it away is because we're so uncomfortable around pain and we think that pain is there to be removed. Um, but it's not, you know, if somebody would tell you about, oh, my sister got engaged, <laughs> you would just say, wow, I'm so happy. You wouldn't feel like you have to now go and uh, buy her a wedding gown. <laughs> You know what I mean? Now you're going to go plan the wedding. No, you heard, she heard, she's just sharing because she wants to share. And what if we apply that to pain? You know, someone shared something painful. It's like, oh, you know, depends on the relationship. And if you're but, not sure and it's, and it's a good friend, you can also ask. That's what being a friend is. It's being there in the way that the other person needs you. So that's great. As long as it's coming from a real place of caring. You know, because sometimes the same question could come across as uncaring. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it could sound like, mm -hmm. oh, what do you want from me? <laughs> you know what I mean? That when, when we really care, it comes across. No matter, it's not even so much about what we say, it's how we feel. You know, without Hashem, we see our pain as shame. And that's debilitating. It's paralyzing. It's so, it's so, it's so destructive. And, and, and because we get desperate for relief from that, because it's so, it's so misery, it's so miserable, um, that leads to all kinds of spiraling out of control behavior. Um, you know, addictive behavior, using our phone, and we all do that at different times. It, I don't know that he didn't experience pain deeply, but he was able to always put it in perspective um, and not mm -hmm. take it as a thing of shame, but just incorporate it in his, in, 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 in his life, in his purpose, in the meaning, in the direction, you know, in context of his better self. I don't, I don't see it as, as something that would take away the feeling, but, but you can have a deep appreciation um, and a deep perspective, even as you have deep pain. The pain is very real. The pain is there, but the low is not the pain because pain in itself doesn't make us disempowered. It's our misery. It's our shame. It's our beliefs about the pain that makes us so disempowered. It's that commentary that we have about the pain that because of this, we'll never be okay. I don't know anyone in the world who hasn't gone through pain, but even, even not on a personal level, you know, if you're open to the world, if you're open to your neighbors, if you're open to Gullus itself, pain is so big. It's so part of our lives, especially today. I, I and probably they felt this way in other generations that pain was very real, but they were busy surviving. They weren't busy talking about the pain, <laughs> but I, I, I don't think it's possible. I think that everybody, you know, could fall into 
one of three categories. Either you're miserable, right? Either the pain takes you to misery and self-destructive behaviors and, um, you know, in that direction, you need to numb and avoid and escape because you're not, you're not feeling the pain or, you know, or you're in work processing the pain and it's not shame and it's, you know, and it's, uh, and it's, and it's incorporated into your purposeful part of your life. And the third thing is just plain old denial and lack of awareness. <laughs> you know, numbing, but not in a destructive way. There are certain kinds of behaviors that, you know, if someone's an alcoholic, if someone's, uh, uh, um, you know, using drugs, smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, um, you know, browsing the internet in a way that's really dysfunctional, gets in their way of their ability to function, then you can see, okay, this person's pain is big enough that they really need to avoid it. Their experience of pain is so much. But most of us, I think, fall into the category of functional misery. <laughs> like, I'm miserable, but I'm functioning enough. I'm not really dealing with my pain in a productive way, but I'm not dysfunctional about it. You know what I mean? That's the third category. How could somebody not be in pain in today's world? I mean, just look at the news, unless they're living in a cave somewhere in Iceland where they have no access to any Jewish news outlet or any world news outlet. I mean, Baruch Hashem, I, I, I stopped reading the news a little while ago because it was so, I couldn't deal with it. <laughs> it was really bringing me, you know, but even the Jewish news, you know, I mean, how could you hear the story of a young father passing away, leaving orphans behind or a young mother in a hospital struggling for every breath of life? Like, how could we not hear about that and not be in pain? I wanna tell you something. Some people look at stress, misery and resentment as a natural pa part of life. And they kind of take it in stride and they don't call it pain. They just call it, you know what? This is how it is. This is how it is, you know? Re this is life, you know? They don't look at it as pain. You could only experience pain when you have a vision of how it's supposed to be then the resentment is a loss of a relationship. If you kind of expect, do, do you hear what I'm saying? If you kind of expect misery, then you expect life to be unhappy, then you're not in pain by the loss of happiness. A lot of us think that if I don't like it, that's the end of the story, period, dead end. I don't like it, the end, <laughs> but that's not the end. It doesn't mean that's the end. I don't like it, so now what? How am I going to make myself like it? Or how am I going to get myself through it? Despite the fact that I don't like it. We all have things in our lives that, and, and when we can't do that, that's when we're miserable because, you know, it's like you're driving the car and you're, you're going over a bump. I hate going over the pump. I hate, I hate, I hate it. You know? So you you brace yourself yeah, for impact to... and you never breathe. You know what I mean? You're like, ah, you can, mm. you fight it. You kind of, you know, stop instead of bracing yourself for impact and like, you know, not for impact, but for the displeasure of going over that bump, you know, my visual for that is, you know, you take out the hammer and you take out the ax and you chop and you chop and, you, and you're hacking and you're hacking away at the bump. It's not movable. You're not going to get it away. You're just going to make yourself more miserable, right? We have to kind of, we have to accept that not all, yeah, that discomfort is part of life and we have to give ourselves courage to go through it instead of seeing it as a dead end. Yeah. yeah, thank you for sharing that. The, the, the meaning of why we say those words are, are, uh, is because Baruch Diana Emes means we're acknowledging that Hashem knows what he's doing. Um, we're not telling it to them, chas v'shalom. We're telling it to ourselves. It's not something you're supposed to tell any person. Baruch mm -hmm. Diana Emes is something we say to ourselves. We're back here, Mir Hashem, on Wednesday at 12.30 in the afternoon, um, Eastern time for a discussion about Purim. Purim is called Purim. Mostly every Yom Tov is called for the miracle of Purim. And yet Purim is called for the name, after the name of the plan to destroy us. So what's in the name and what's the message of that for us? And, and I think by exploring that, we will come to a deeper appreciation of what Purim is about. And I'm really excited to talk about it. Um, 
I actually scheduled it because I want to learn about Purim. So that's, <laughs> that's my inspiration to learn about Purim. So I'm looking forward. Have a good night. Thank you so much for joining. Yes. And, and um, I want to, again, close with a bracha that Hashem should really answer all our tefillahs and relieve us of the pain of Golas and bring Mashiach speedily.